Hello and welcome everyone to this very informative um, panel that we're gonna have today. My name is Cornelia Davis. I'm the CTO here at Weaveworks. And today I am joined by Bharat, Paul and Nick. Um, and we're gonna be talking about something really fascinating, which is all around platforms that enable developers to operate at a scale that they couldn't before. Um, I think what you'll find interesting is that this is in the context of probably one of the most regulated industries that you've seen to date. So this isn't some born in the web startup that's always operated like this. This is a story of transformation. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation and I hope that you enjoy as much as we do. Before we kick into the topic at hand, I'd like each of the panelists to spend a little bit more time telling us a little bit about your background and the context in which we're gonna have the conversation. Brat, can we start with you, please? Sure, thanks for having us, Cornelia. Uh, we, uh, Raft, I'm, my name is Bharat. I'm uh, the CTO for Raft. Raft is a non-traditional small business uh, in the federal sector. Uh, we've been in the CNCF community from the early days, uh, early adopters to Kubernetes, Kafka, and Cassandra operators uh, back in 2017, I believe. And now we're excited to be working with the Air Force and the DOD on multiple R&D efforts that are uh, uh, around Air Force and uh, large-scale DOD efforts. Excellent. Uh, Paul. Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Otto. I um, work with Barat uh, over at, at Raft. Um, uh, he already gave a good summary of Raft. Uh, so myself, I've been involved in, uh, in software development and infrastructure uh, for, for couple decades. Um, and I, I've, I have military background. So real interesting uh, to be able to be a part of uh, part of efforts with the Air Force now um, on the software side. And um, I, I have had a lot of experience with uh, cluster technologies. And so it's fascinating to work with some of the some of the tooling that we're going to talk about today. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, the star of our show, Nicholas, please. Give us your intro. I don't know about that, but thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Nick Schiller. I'm the Chief Software Officer for the Air Force. I'm also uh, the co-leader of the DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative, which is effectively bringing DevSecOps across the Department of Defense. So the goal is to enable teams to move at the pace of relevance and uh, start adopting Kubernetes and containers across the department and, and really uh, uh, move to uh, a zero trust uh, construct using service meshes and all the modern CNCF stack. Oh, interesting. We will start to dig into that. So thanks for that intro. And I wanna key right off of that, Nick, which is um, how did, you're, you're implying, so first of all, let me ask the question and then a, a two-part question, is you're implying with DevSecOps that the Air Force is a software development organization, which is something that I think might catch some of our audience by surprise. I personally, I, I, I will admit that in my previous life, I did spend time with you, Nick, and with the Air Force in general. So I already know a little bit of the backstory, but 10 years ago, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Air Force would have been considered a software um, engineering shop. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what it looks like today and a little bit about the journey to getting the Air Force to, are they a software development shop? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think any organization, particularly in 2020 and 2021, that is not a software organization is, is uh, about to fail in its mission. Because honestly, if, if you look at innovation and, and the fact that uh, if you want to keep up and compete in, in this world, uh, most of the innovation will be around software. And so effectively, um, yes, we, we are a, a software organization. Uh, we created multiple what we call software uh, factories, and, and the biggest one that was really the uh, starting point for us is Kessel Run, pretty pretty widely known now. A, a lot of airmen and, and, and also contractors from industry partnering to innovate and following the traditional uh, agile construct to, to bring software to life and uh, have this, uh, you know, fast feedback loop so uh, we can uh, bring uh, new innovations in the hands of the wall fires and uh, really make sure we're not building things in a vacuum. Uh, but we 
we kind of pushed that uh, DevOps mindset for us to, to a DevSecOps construct um, to move to have that uh, baked in security. And I think that's really the, the biggest change in the last uh, two years since I started um, with my background as, as a developer myself, but also as a cyber guy, I always um, aim to, to find a middle ground between the two worlds. And, and honestly, you cannot move fast if you're um, going to put you know, either your mission at risk or, or the nation at risk. Um, and so effectively for us, having that baked in security is foundational to the success of the adoption of the software teams. And more importantly, uh, being able to use the software being built in production in actual real life scenarios uh, so we can deliver capability multiple times a day, uh, very much like a SpaceX or Tesla is doing. Oh, interesting. So I, I definitely want to spend more time digging in. And by the way, Abrat and Paul, if I forget to give you a chance to chime in, please just chime in and, and add to what Nick is, is uh, talking about. I definitely want to spend more time talking about the mechanisms that you're using to bake the security into that. Um, and we'll get to that in just a bit. I do have a very direct question for you. Um, so how many roughly, any idea on how many software developers um, are in the Air Force now? And we'll talk a little bit about how you enable them in just a moment, but any idea the magnitude of number of developers? Well, I think it depends uh, by what you mean by Air Force and, and developers. You know, I think um, obviously we have both military and civilian uh, quarters, um, but we also partner with companies and you have a good example here of two people that we partner with. We have thousands of, of companies working with us to bring uh, talents from outside the government into the government as a contractor, uh, which I still consider them to be part of the family, right? So effectively, if you were to compound, you know, both contractors and uh, mi military and civilians, it, it's hundreds of thousands of, it's probably 150 to 100,000 people uh, that we're, we have uh, across DOD. Um, Air Force is a subset of that, but again, the, the goal of everything we do is to uh, enable the entire department to succeed. And so we're not, we're not thinking of the Air Force versus the Navy and the, the Army, we're thinking as a, as a, as a whole unit. Wow. Now that is like a completely different order of magnitude. I, I spend a lot of time out talking with you know corporate enterprises. And sometimes when I ask them, how many developers do you have? They'll say 5,000 or 15,000. You've added another zero to the end of that. So. <laughs> yeah, we're probably the largest organization. It's interesting because not only you're the largest organization on the planet, uh, you probably have also the hardest mission uh, touching nuclear systems, space systems, embedded, embedded weapons, uh, jets, bombers, ships, submarines. Um, so effectively, you have the most complex systems with, oh, by the way, nuclear weapons on it, um, and the, the largest organization with the most silos, but also um, effectively um, the largest number of people. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you've and funding. Just, yeah, so <laughs> and you've funding. just given us you've given us an interesting perspective from the number of application kind of the the magnitude of the different types of applications. Um, Barat, I saw you unmute. In one second, I'll come back to you because I want to tee up one more thing, and then I would love to hear from both of you, from uh, Barat and and Paul as well. So you've used this term DevSecOps. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because you just talked about the apps. Um, but to, you know, kind of a bit of a leading question to give the audience a context to bring it all together is with the DevSec, DevSecOps, what you're doing is you are providing enough capabilities so that these application teams can operate in this DevSecOps model. So can you tell us a little bit more about what DevSecOps means from a very practical standpoint to those application teams and then to the platform team that you have the logo behind you um, that we're gonna talk more about in just a moment. It's perfect for my ears. Um, <laughs> so I, I think there, there are a couple of things. Obviously not everyone will agree with what I'm gonna say, but that's okay. Um, for us, DevSecOps is the evolution of DevOps. It's uh, bringing security baked in. And, and the reason why we didn't call the initiative SecDevOps 
uh, for two reasons. One, Gene Kim told me we should play DevSecOps, so we mm-hmm. called it what, what he said. And the second reason is cyber is never first. Uh, when people say that, it just, it just unless you're building a cyber product, it makes no sense. Uh, you don't wake up and be like, yeah, I'm going to build this, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to think cyber and no, you're going to wake up and, and think of a new idea or innovation or something tangible you want to bring to life. So by definition, cyber is never first. It, it also should never be last, but it's, it should be baked in. And that's the, the, the key aspect of everything we do. Uh, effectively for me, when I think of that spec ops, and again, not everybody is going to agree. It's, it's a maturity construct. It's an evolution of DevOps. Uh, many people don't even understand the problem yet because they are not facing it. But there are a couple of key uh, pillars to to enable the adoption of, of DevSecOps. The first one is zero trust. So everything we do is based on zero trust architecture, both for ingress, egress, and east-west traffic. So we use a service mesh. We use Istio, but we could use any service mesh. Um, and that's certainly a foundation of everything in terms of security. The second pillar is the continuous monitoring side. So uh, we know that signatures and, and, and scanning is never going to be able to find zero days and and uh, uh, things running on the network in runtime. So the key aspect of everything we do is around behavioral detection and continuously monitoring the behavior of containers and seeing uh, any drift of behavior as, as, as problematic. Um, and then everything is uh, founded on that infrastructure as code GitOps mindset where your design stays in Git and, uh, you know, everything um, is in is in Git um, and, and your uh, production or staging environment will pull from Git continuously to implement whatever change you want to make um, to ensure you have no drift and no um, – no change between production and, and your desired state, and no one connecting to your production cluster type commands or going to uh, fancy dashboards and UI, all, all these cool Kubernetes products to drift your production um, in runtime. So we want always uh, any change to be made in code, and no product should bypass uh, the, the Git aspect of that. Um, and that's the foundation. So we ensure that... Uh, the thousands of, of clusters we end up running in DoD uh, don't drift between each other. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to dig it more into many of the things that you just mentioned. Um, but before we dig into that, um, Bharat, I, you wanted to chime in. Some of the areas that I'm particularly interested in and that I think our audience would be is the role that Raft plays. Are you helping build these applications? Are you helping build out Platform One? Um, are you bringing kind of DevOps experience? Paul, you talked about software development experience. Can you go, give us a little perspective of how you, the role that you play in this Platform One initiative? Sure, sure. And to Nick's point, I mean, I, I don't look at uh, Raf's role as either dev side or platform side or ops side. I think to make the mission work, we all have to touch different pieces and, and that goes back to not working in our silos. Uh, and going back to the previous point, I think uh, this cultural shift within the DoD where we were all work in a badgeless and egoless environment where we all work together towards one mission and that one mission being national security. So I think that has been a cultural shift that I've at least personally seen for the last four to five years where um, uh, airmen coders, whether they have a badge or not badge, whether they're wearing uniform or not, are working alongside contractors and vendors to enable the mission. Um, as far as platform one and the foundation goes, I think the DevSecOps model only works when you give the developers paradigms to, uh, to work in, right? So that developer needs a short feedback cycle. The developer should not be waiting on a cyber to approve something for it to com- come back just because they want to enable that feature back in production. And that, I think that's what platform one has enabled that ecosystem of continuous delivery that when you, as soon as you push your code into Git, it goes through that continuous monitoring cycle. It goes through those twist lock scans and goes through the zero day scans so that the developer at the end of the day gets that uh, instant feedback or short feedback. Can I, can I add one thing? I was, I was thinking of uh, back to what Nick was talking about. He, you know, he invoked the name of Gene Kim and uh <laughs> And so I, I latched on to something. Uh, I was going back through some uh, some podcasts that you did recently, and you know, one at the beginning of the month was with you know 
the master. <laughs> and uh, and so a, a quote that I, I liked that he had said, you know, part of it was like, you know, that make large scale changes uh, to parts of the system without permission from anyone outside the team. You know, that that's like a predictor of whether or not, you know, a project can move really fast or not, and if it might even be successful. And I would say like, if that was say one of the theories of uh, DevOps, then I would say maybe a corollary to that would be that in order for DevSecOps to be successful, that security needs to be able to be implemented without any outsiders being able to, you know, having to turn off and on flags. So from our experience working with Platform One and Big Bang is that uh, the way that security is implemented, you know, it's security first, that security is already present, it's capable, and it's just a matter of tagging certain resources to say, these need to be enabled, you know, to go through the authenticator service. And as long as that, you know, that you're putting into place certain things that are non-starters in, in the, the agreements that we have on how to use Big Bang, then you already have security. It is enabled, you're able to consume these security resources without ever reaching out to the, uh, the cybersecurity people outside of the team. If there's any specific special thing cases that have to be addressed, sure. But the security first mindset, things are going to be locked down, you know, at the starting point. You know, even if you're working on MVP, it's already there. I think that's what you mean by baked in, right, Nick? It's right. baked in. That was a concrete example. Yeah, effectively, the the development team should not have to worry about uh, security and and and. And they should inherit a lot of the cyber controls we're putting in place day one. And, and that's why, you know, when you look at the implementation of Platform One, 90% of the NIST the cyber security uh, uh, controls are inherited day one, uh, whether it's through the, the platform with, with Kubernetes, whether it's uh, through the service mesh, or uh, we have a continuous uh, sidecar container stack that's uh, injected alongside every every container uh, to to inject uh, some of these cyber capabilities, centralizing logs and telemetry, uh, doing that uh, behavior detection, doing that uh, reverse proxy with Envoy to to do the uh, mutual TLS tunneling and authentication, and um, doing the the zero trust enforcement. So service A to talk to service B has to be whitelisted and all that good stuff. That's something you have day one, and, and that's really uh, kind of the big lesson learned of any organization that's trying to move to DevSecOps is uh, focusing the, some time and energy in, in building a dedicated team to bring a platform, uh, what we call a software factory, uh, on demand uh, to life. So not every development team has to worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, that's good. And I want to dig again, I'm going to just about to go to some of those, th those core elements, um, like sidecars, and I want to slow down a little bit there, but I, you, uh, Paul, you use two terms that I want to give Nicholas a chance to clarify for our audience, because they don't all know this platform one and big bang. Can you tell us Nicholas yeah. what those are? Yeah, so Platform One is the, so we have Cloud One, Platform One. So Cloud One is the cloud office for the DoD, which can bring uh, Amazon and Azure and classified clouds to life. So teams can get access to cloud providers uh, and, and have an accredited environment day one instead of spending six, six to eight months to, to do that, uh, sometimes a year. So saving a tremendous amount of time. Platform One is the DevSecOps team that can bring a DevSecOps stack on top of any environment. It does not have to be a cloud. It could be on-premise, on the jet, on the bomber, on the space system, doesn't matter. Uh, Platform One can be instantiated on demand. We use GitOps to so push button deployment to deploy the entire stack. Uh, Big Bang is that instantiation of a, of a Platform One environment. So effectively, when you take the Big Bang code, which, by the way, we open source, and you, you mentioned a little bit of the fact that uh, uh, for one, COD is kind of leading and, and sharing also with industry and, and with open source communities and, and building a very strong foundation of uh, open source engagements uh, being part of the CNCF and also uh, uh, open sourcing the big bank source code, for example. So so for teams, any anyone can go on the repo one, which is repo L -L -E -P -O one uh, dot DSO dot mail, and they can uh, download the big bank code 
uh, IEC and, and push button deploy Big Bang on their clouds, effectively getting a replica a replica of Platform One on their environment. Um, and, and then we have the party bus. The party bus is a, a multi-tenant environment, so that's a big bang, but that's deployed and managed by my team. And we maintain it, we host it, and we provide at different classification levels for us. So, so development teams don't have to uh, deploy a dedicated big bang. They can just use the party bus. But the big bang gives the ability to, to kind of have that dedicated enclave completely siloed from any other tenant. So, so that's a great capability, obviously. Uh, okay, so the party bus is, if you will, the SaaS offering of Big That's Bang. right, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to go back to some of these core elements. You've mentioned, uh, you talked a little bit about sidecars, but I'm going to back up even a little bit before that. Because again, with the focus of SEC, with the focus of DevSecOps, um, let's start with containers. Um, containers, of course, offer you some capability of baking security in. So what, how do you use the concept, the element of a, of a container? What kind of security does that offer you? Yeah, so obviously we're not thinking of containers as, as, a, as, a, as a unit of, of security. It's more about... Um, uh, because you you can you can you know get your way around the security of the container. What I think is why it ties back to security is because you have a, a very small footprint. You can you can deploy a very precise set of things inside of that container. Ideally, a microservice, very small, not a big fat bloated container uh, like some of uh, the the good commercial organizations moving from VMs to containers often do. So when you when you're going to cut it into microservices, you can have a very small attack surface, and that's easier to monitor behavior and know exactly what's going on. So we created the Iron Bank, which is the kind of the Docker hub of of DoD, but we made it open source so anyone can go and consume the containers. And we centrally hold in about 350 uh, containers, both open source and commercial products. And so first we're going to rebase and. Uh, retract the supply chain of some of the de dependencies and tracking where those are coming from and updating them and hardening them day one so teams can consume the containers and not have to worry about that but also because they are small and to the point um, and we create like cattle instead of pets um, those can effectively um, have a very well understood behavior and any drift of behavior will trigger uh, prevention mechanism that will either kill the container or alert, alert the team. And that's obviously uh, a great way to mitigate issues, but it also gives us that uh, auto-scaling capability of uh, obviously uh, scaling up and down based on memory or compute needs, um, the containers as well. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So you talked about hardening. Um, you talked about the, the repository where scanning is implemented and so on. So this, this is, for those folks who are not quite as well versed on container and container technology, the container represents this really great element in which you can start to address some of the security concerns like hardening, scanning, um, and we'll get, I want to come back to the drift detection in, in just a little bit when we talk about GitOps more. Um, so super cool. Now you've mentioned sidecars. So I'm going to take just a moment for the audience who isn't as familiar. We talked about containers. Containers are running and they've got something in them. They've been hardened, so they cannot be mucked with. They cannot be changed. Um, but this is, I, the, for those of you, again, who don't know, this sidecar is another container that sits side by side with where the application is. So the whole concept here is that the developer only worries about their container that has their content in it. And the sidecar brings a lot of the baked in security. So can you again, maybe summarize some of the key security elements that are not running that the application developer isn't responsible for because the application is communicating through the sidecar or through the proxy. So can you talk about some of the security elements that are implemented in that sidecar? Yeah, first maybe a little step back on, on the sidecar. Um, obviously to inject the sidecar, you need orchestration and to uh, orchestrate your containers, you wanna make sure they auto scale, they, they, if they crash, they self heal and restore. Um, and so we use Kubernetes, right? And, and part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. 
so we have multiple options of different products between VMware, Red Hat, you know, uh, Rancher, Convoy, AKS, EKS, you name it. So that gives us diversity, but it also gives us something that's pretty significant for security, which is the abstraction of not getting locked into a single product. So that that API is abstracted, and, and if you if you end up consuming cloud resources, uh, you talk to the Kubernetes API. Your application is designed around Kubernetes APIs, and that is abstracting you from the cloud provider. Uh, that's the first step. And and Kubernetes can be set up to inject automatically cycles alongside your workload. And and the the critical and what people don't understand mostly yet is the the key difference of the injection mechanism. If you think of the traditional way to inject a, a, a cyber capability on the VM, it's most likely going to be an agent running on the VM, which creates a tight coupling between your VM and your agent. Effectively, if you need to update the agent, your cyber agent, you need to update the VM. And and that obviously creates um, release uh, constraint to update either the, the agent or the workload that you're running inside of that VM. And that creates high coupling between the cyber teams and the, 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 the team building building whatever software you're trying to build. With a cycle, uh, because it's injected at the long side, so it's not inside, you can update that independently and you don't have tight coupling between the two. That's the first benefit. The second benefit is because it's injected automatically no matter the workload, even if your software team does not even know about the cyber tool, doesn't know anything about cyber, uh, they're going to get that cycle regardless. That wouldn't be true with a VM. The VM team would have to know that, hey, you have to install an agent, get the latest version. They're going to mess up. You're going to have tight coupling, so you're going to have to wait to release the new versions. A good example of that was during SolarWinds, we um, we added a few additional um, detection mechanisms, and we could do that um, without having to coordinate the deployment of that capability with all the 153 product teams, 2,400 developers we have on, on the party bus, for example. We could just inject or update the cycle or inject a new cycle uh, if we wanted and, and not have to coordinate any any release planning. Um, so that's, that's foundational to, to move fast, right? So, so forget about even the, the benefit of cyber just in terms of the, the pace, right, the, the, the timeliness aspect of, which is, by the way, foundational to cyber. If you can move fast in cyber, you create more risk. Uh, because you can react react to zero days and, and stuff like that. So the sidecar mechanism can be used to inject many different concepts. We use uh, uh, Beats and FluentD to be able to push logs. So all the logs from each container is pushed to Elasticsearch, and that's how we centralize logs and telemetry of the applications. That's a sidecar that's automatically pulling the logs and pushing it to where we want it to be. That's a great, easy way to centralize logs and telemetry. If you want to try to do that in a different way, that would be very complex. Uh, we also use the sidecar concept to do what you said, which is a reverse proxy. We use E2 as a service mesh, and the, the service mesh for people that don't know is uh, managing the traffic between containers, what we call the east-west traffic. Container A to talk to B, and he does a lot, of, a lot more in terms of uh, modern routing and A/B testing and, and, and a bunch of load balancing stuff as well. But effectively, it's, it's, it's injecting the sidecar container as a reverse proxy, and the reverse proxy is able to inject. Um, rules inside the IP tables to create automatically, for example, a mutual TLS tunnel. So even if my team didn't think about encryption for container H stock to be, uh, I know regardless I'm going to have a mutual TLS tunnel because the service mesh is going to inject with a cycle, uh, a tunnel, an encrypted tunnel, and use a strong certificate, uh, X509 certificate, uh, to authenticate service A to service B. So um, to whitelist the traffic between A and B, someone has to create that whitelist uh, to allow the traffic to flow, creating a zero trust construct and using certificate, which are rotating um, multiple times a day and, and all that done uh, at no cost and automatically by the service mesh without having uh, to worry about any of that stuff on, from the developer standpoint. So uh, again, the cycle is, is acting effectively as a firewall, as a reverse proxy, as an identity mechanism, authentication mechanism, um, so, so it, it's game changing, right? To, to to replace all these things you would have to do. And by the way, if you if you were not using a cycle, uh, you you would have tight coupling again with all these mechanisms. Um, and, and so, if you were to update your uh, TLS crypto uh, because you have a zero day on encryption bits, 
uh, you need now to go and update hundreds of VMs or whatever if you're not using a cycle. With our concept, we can update the, the TLS crypto and the cycle, and we know we're using the latest crypto regardless, right? So, so again, just demonstrating the, the key around de DevOps, by the way, is about decoupling and the ability to release incremental changes in, in a small, tiny unit of merger uh, and, and being able to cut monolithic systems into microservices. And to do that, uh, you would not be able to succeed uh, in a, any type of significant volume of services if you don't have a service mesh because all that authentication mechanism, all those communication paths between microservices have to be then tightly coordinated and those updates between programming languages and, oh, by the way, you have to start deploying things inside of each programming language construct, uh, having to update libraries and bits across languages, where a sidecar is ag language agnostic, it doesn't even care what language you're using, and he's going to be able to hi hijack the, the e ingress, egress traffic to that container. So effectively, everything has to flow through the sidecar first to get into the container so it gives you visibility. And the final piece on the cyber side, because it's not an agent inside a VM, if, if a VM is compromised, the first thing a bad actor is gonna do is tamper with the logs and with the agent and, and your agent is worthless and you can see what's going on. With a, a sidecar, because it's alongside, not inside the container, it's very difficult for, for a bad actor to hide what he's doing because the sidecar is still able to see what's going on uh, you know, and, and so effectively you, you get that visibility aspect of cyber that would be uh, more compromised in a, in a VM sense. So that's, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot, but it's super fascinating. Um, and I will tell you that I was working in Cloud Foundry, which is an application platform that does some of the things that you've been describing, Nicholas. Um, when service meshes in sidecars started emerging on the scene and I immediately looked at it and said, holy smokes, this is a distributed implementation of a platform that has yep, yep. all of these capabilities. And I did, that's one of the things that I thought it was so sweet. And when you were describing that, Paul, I was coming back to what you quoted earlier, which is all about autonomy. Um, we tried to do that again in the Cloud Foundry setting and achieved some level of success. But I loved your story, Nick, about solar winds. Is like you didn't have to go out to 150,000 developers and synchronize their release schedules and all of that stuff to address this vulnerability. You were able to just inject something kind of autonomous. So, any comments, Brad or Paul? Um, well, can, I'll uh, comment. Uh, it's a little bit of a pivot, uh, but it is on the same uh, general topic as going back to containers themselves is, um, you know, and moving quickly. Um, so, you know, as, as Nick has, uh, has mentioned, uh, you know, we're talking about platform one is something that goes across multiple types of environments and big bang is meant to be able to be deployed, uh, in any kind of setting. And as one might imagine, you know, military, uh, has settings that are air gapped as well as settings that are that are on gov cloud or on premise and so uh, one of the things that I, I had the privilege of participating in uh, here just wrapped up last week was um, a month-long push in getting uh, what they call the shadow uh, operating center uh, up and running and that was using a full uh, platform one big bang based deployment and um, you know, the, the challenges that normally you would have in moving from something that was being primarily run in a cloud environment to running that on premise are usually large and insurmountable. I mean, you're talking about months and months of migration efforts. Um, I've been a part of them going both ways at other companies. And um, uh, we were able to get up and running, you know, from start, like just bare metal with nothing running on it uh, to being able to demo, demo out to, you know, DOD at large uh, within a matter of a few weeks with everything running, including the application uh, environments uh, that these application developers hadn't ever gotten a chance to test on this, uh, this environment, you know, be, but because they were containerized, they were 
because they could run in one environment, they could run on this environment. And as long as there are certain principles that are already met, um, then, then they're just going to work because they already know what kind of service, uh, service routes they're going to use, what kind of patterns they're going to use, the sidecars uh, help with doing all the coordination of the routing, and the MTLS is already there by default, so everything is already secured. There wasn't any kind of like security that had to be built special for this. The, de the devs didn't have to go back and rewrite any of their backend code. It just worked, and yeah. I mean, that was like a testament to, you know, not only, you know, containerization and, you know, everything, but, you know, Big Bang as, as a, as a product, uh, an open source product to yeah. be able to work in multiple environments like that. I mean, to some extent, this sounds holy grailish to me. And you just gave a very specific <laughs> example like it. <laughs> of it totally worked. I mean, we've been wanting this level of portability for as long as I've been in the industry, and I'm sure longer than that. And that's been 30 years. So, um, so that's really cool. I'd like to turn our attention now a little bit, um, somewhat self-servingly, to GitOps, because WeaveWorks is the GitOps company. Um, so you mentioned it earlier, Nick, um, is that you use Git as the kind of single source of truth. And you've also talked, mentioned several times drift detection. So if you're going to do drift detection, it's drift against what? And that's where I think GitOps has is playing a significant role. It's the drift against to this the single source of truth. So can you say a little bit more about what you're doing from a GitOps-based approach? Yeah, effectively GitOps is, is game changing for, for the industry, right? Um, it's gonna be that uh, replicable, automated, uh, immutable construct where uh, your change management, everything happens in Git. Effectively, we, we have multiple set of eyes on code change. So uh, depending on the severity of the change, it could be uh, two set of eyes or three set of eyes. So again, everything from change management to disaster recovery, where uh, you need to simply back up your Git repo and your databases and you have a full disaster recovery of your system. That All that is game changing. Effectively, everything is in Git uh, from networking changes to um, passwords and keys, and, and of course, they are sealed and encrypted, and there are different ways to, to do that in a secure fashion. Don't don't put, don't put passwords and keys, please, unencrypted. Yep. Um, but but you can have a full construct of your desired state. And, and back to your point on drift, the, the key is then to monitor your staging and your production uh, environment and look at anything that's not in Git. And anything that's drifting or, or not present in Git is effectively either malicious or drift. And that should never happen. Effectively, you reduce your attack surface by closing ports, not having humans in production. Don't have someone typing SSH commands or cube control commands or, um, you know, deploying helm charts or operators manually uh, in Git in, in, in the cluster. You do everything in Git and then you have tools like Algo or Flux. Uh, to then pull from Git continuously and apply that change uh, as well. And we also use projects like Atlantis for uh, Terraform uh, GitOps use cases as well. But uh, And I think it's interesting how the, the GitOps community is evolving between the Algo and the Flux community merging and working together. There are pros and cons on, on both tools, you know, better support of Helm uh, when it comes to Flux and, and different architecture designs when it comes to Argo. I mean, there's a lot of interesting uh, moving parts there, but I think it changes the way you think also of your continuous delivery. Effectively, uh, your CI tool will, will be focusing on the scanning and the testing and, and, and all that, but it's not going to have that uh, your GitLab CI or your Jenkins or whatever uh, CI capabilities that you use. It's not going to have the keys to your kingdom in production to push changes to production so that reduce your attack surface. And, and instead, um, the production or the staging environment will pull from Git. So it has no ports open. Um, it is pulling. It's not a push. So it's not receiving uh, from a, a different stack having keys to the kingdom, which, by the way, the keys are high elevated keys because they have to deploy workloads. So that's a very big risk. Um, and so effectively, you reduce your attack surface, you, you have a, a, an ability to instantiate your stack like 
uh, you know, like Paul described with some of our use cases, we have air gapped environment. We need to be able to push, put and deploy, walk away and you, you come back and you have a full stack up and running with no change between your unclassed cloud uh, use case and your jet or your um, on-premise environment. So that's, that's just game changing, right? Yeah, and, and Flux, for example, also goes in the opposite direction. So it is part of that drift detection mechanism because if somebody right. does the modern day equivalent of SSHing into a box, i.e. kube cuddle apply, Flux will reverse that for you. Um, right. So, yeah. so that's part of the drift detection as well. Now I'm going to, we're reaching the end of our hour and there's one more topic I wanna to tee up with you, but I'm gonna take just a moment as a transition from what we've been talking about over into that to mention, Nick just talked about Argo and Flux and, and GitOps in general. I wanted to make everybody aware, if you're not already, that there within the CNCF is a GitOps working group. It's under the app delivery SIG uh, the special interest group, and it's open to anyone. And we have a really great, vibrant community there that is really looking to, we're still in the early days of GitOps, really looking to uh, evolve the education, understanding, and co-innovation of what's happening in the GitOps space. So I invite everyone to join us there. But speaking of the CNCF, you've been talking about all these technologies. They're all open source. So I sometimes when I'm in a corporate environment and I talk to customers about open source, they're like, yeah, no, our lawyers are not going to allow us to do that. It is too much of a pain, you know, that type of a thing. So here we have the federal government of the United States of America that is adopting open source. And you even said we open source some stuff. So Nick, tell me, how did you do that? What, what, what how, how did you convince the federal government to do open source? Well, I think, you know, what was interesting is we had an event where we had a piece of, uh, of software that uh, was never seen outside of the government. And, and of course, a lot of people think, you know, oh, obfuscation or hiding things is um, equal to security. And so we brought that piece of equipment uh, to DEF CON two years ago. And within four minutes, uh, we were uh, hacked uh, and they had root access to the box. Um, and then, you know, over 10 minutes, there was like 25 people in and, and whatever. Uh, so that demonstrates that obfuscation and, and the set, full sense of security of hiding IP or, uh, is not protecting you in runtime. You know, uh, someone will get in. And that's scary, right? Four minutes is pretty pretty quick. Um, and so I think we demonstrated that, hey, op openness and uh, multiple set of eyes on things bring value. And, and piggybacking on the investment of uh, major organizations makes sense. Now, there is a risk in open source, right? And particularly for smaller projects that are not maintained by a lot of different people, where you have the, maybe monopoly of a single company, or maybe uh, you have a lot of foreign you know, involvement for us, you know, China, Russia, North Korea, developers. Uh, that, that could be a problem, particularly when there is no diversity and, and multiple set of eyes on, on what's going on, because, you know, they, they are looking at injecting malicious uh, software into the supply chain. So that's, that's really a, a big risk. Uh, but uh, we uh, bet on the big part of the big uh, upstream projects, right? Kubernetes, Istio, um, you know, I mean, talk about Flux, I'll go, you know, um, I mean, it's endless. I, I can't even <laughs> think of the yeah. name, but there are so many of the CNCF projects we're using. And, and we, you know, I uh, made, made sure that the Air Force was the first government uh, member of CNCF uh, two years ago when I started. And then, you know, we started to start consuming open source. And now we open source our code with a big bang in the container hardening, which, by the way, is way, way better than what you can find on, on Docker Hub and other um, registries in terms of security and, and the type of assessment. You wouldn't believe the number of CVs we uh, we forced uh, vendors to fix, including some of the most consumed uh, DevSecOps tools on the planet, um, and, and including some cyber products that you know don't uh, uh, put their uh, mouth where the, their uh, the, put their money where their mouth is, and not uh, fixing their own dependencies as well. Uh, so we do a significant amount of work in in making sure products get safer for everybody. And then we contribute back. So we pushed uh, countless patches and updates to upstream projects. And uh, that's also helping making all of us more secure. Yeah. 
So for all of you CIOs, corporate, you know, global 2000 CIOs that are listening to this, if, uh, if the Air Force can do it, you can too. So, all right. Yes, they like for no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we do it on, on, on weapon systems and, and nuclear systems. And, and so if we can do it, that's, uh, that yeah. was my closing argument yeah. of my uh, CNCF uh, keynote two years ago when we could still uh, go places. Uh, if we can do it, uh, so, you can, so can you, so. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I'll, I'll, right. I'll say it from the, oh, sorry, just, just final point. For, from, from the other side, I mean, it's about attracting talent too, right? I mean, I worked in DOD four years ago. I, I didn't want to do it anymore using those outdated tools when non-DOD. But then when we start seeing open source contributions and open source tools, it attracts talent because folks want to work on those projects and then be able to contribute back. And if you can do that while uh, being in the national security arena as well, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, 2.2 times more likely to resign talent, so. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a notable statistic. All right, um, we have reached the end of our time together. Uh, I wanna thank you all, Bharat, Paul, and Nick, for the great conversation. Um, I have enjoyed it a great deal. I've enjoyed being um, kind of your, your tour guide. Um, and I really hope that the audience does as well. And I hope we'll see you again sometime. Definitely, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.